One of, the presentation, one of the presenters today is Dr. Larry Gerbens. He graduated from Calvin College in 1969. He spent his career as an ophthalmologist right here in the Rapids. He's now retired and back at Calvin College. He's working in Calvin Advancement. He's a member of Calvin Academy for Lifelong Learning. He's an instructor in call courses and will be teaching one again later. And now he's at the top of his game a noontime series presenter. <laughs> he will introduce two other presenters joining him today. A warm welcome for Dr. Gibbons and friends. Thank you, Dan. It is really a pleasure to be here. Um, I knew Armand Marazon well. I was his ophthalmologist. Um, we also represented Armand when uh, we owned Grand Gallery uh, in Grand Rapids, so this is a, a real treat. I'd like to introduce Muriel Zanstra, who's behind me. Muriel is a Calvin College graduate, 1966. And um, as a freshman at Calvin, she met the Marazon family, lived near them, and became the Marazon family babysitter which started a lifelong relationship with the family. And uh, Muriel um, authored the 2005 documentary on Armand, and then the 2017 uh, book um, that's um, in the back. Um, uh, it's a, just a beautiful book, uh, um, recognizing Armand as a person and as a talented artist has really been Muriel's life work. Our other present presenter, who is really the main guy today, is also a Calvin College graduate. Graduated from Dr. Scott Westhouse, graduated from Calvin in 2000. So he's really the baby up here uh, in, in this group. Uh, Scott is a vitreoretinal surgeon at uh, Retinal Specialists of Michigan. And Muriel and I really want to thank Scott for um, going along with this idea um, Scott's the main man. Muriel and I are kind of doing, going to do color commentary today. But when we came to Scott with the idea of having him talk about a, a very current topic uh, for all of you, macular degeneration, um, Scott really um, bought into it in a big way. In fact, he got away with his wife to someplace warm and I think actually took the book and the, and the DVD with him I don't know what his wife thought of that. Um, but anyway, so Scott has really uh, bought in and, and has done a lot of planning with us. So um, Scott, would you take it from here? Thank you, Larry. Uh, the truth is Dr. Gerbens asked me to speak a little bit about macular degeneration. Then when we started to talk about how we were gonna lay this out, he said, well, why don't you just take it and run with it and we'll just add a little tidbits here and there. So. That's, uh, that's where we're at now. But I really did uh, read through Muriel's book, which is fascinating, and, uh, and just was really intrigued, intrigued with, with Armand's story. So I love a good story of human accomplishment, especially a story of human accomplishments while overcoming significant odds. Um, one such story has had a profound impact on my life and influenced my decision to pursue a career as a retina specialist. So that little, little boy there is actually me standing next to my grandpa. I grew up with a grandfather who was blinded by diabetes at a young age. He was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 21. And by the time he was 36, my mom was 12, he had lost most functional vision and shortly thereafter lost all of his vision and lived the remainder of his life with the absence of light. However, his life was anything but dark. We washed cars together, we walked to the donut shop together. In retrospect, uh, probably not the best place for a brittle diabetic patient to hang out, <laughs> but that's where his friends were. He, re he rarely missed a Detroit Tigers game on the radio. He made it to almost every South Christian high school basketball game and would listen to the game on the radio while attending the game. The radio announcer at the high school game said he announced differently, knowing that my grandpa was in the stands listening. He was a positive role model with an infectious giggle. I never heard my grandpa complain, never. 
He was trained as a transcriptionist, yeah, a blind transcriptionist, and was employed by Steelcase. As if blindness wasn't enough, he had a kidney transplant in 1978, a below-the-knee amputation a few years later, among other severe complications of diabetes. He had a profound impact on my life, and I have the opportunity now to care for individuals just like him because of his influence on my life. I continue to be fascinated by the sense of vision. I marvel at God's design of the eye. I continue to be fascinated by patients that I see daily that have overcome all odds. And so that is why I was drawn to, that's what drew me to this story of Armand Marazan. I confess I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm not an expert artist. I'm uh, I'm not the t person you'd come to if you wanted some critique of this artwork here. Um, without knowing it though, I was exposed to his artwork growing up. This little book here, this children's hymn book, is actually the artistry of Armin Marazan. And I grew up seeing this in the piano bench at my house. And I was always fascinated by how this picture drew you in. It's not a typical hymnal. I'm used to seeing a hymnal as something that's blue or gray or maroon and plain on the front, <laughs> but not this one. This image, as I was reading through Muriel's book, I see this image and I said, I know where that image is from. This hung in the walls at Spectrum Health. I worked as a nurse's aide before medical school and walking through the halls at Spectrum Health, I would see this image and it fascinated me. Little did I know that, that that was another one of Armin's pictures. This here is one other example of my path crossing with Armin Marazan. This is his, this is a converted chicken coop that sits on uh, their family's house where, where he set up his studio in this chicken coop. Uh, it sits uh, out south of town towards 92nd Street in Kalamazoo. And that's where I, when I was here at Calvin College, our cross-country training on Tuesdays, we would run the hills out at 92nd Street, and I would park my car a stone's throw from his, his studio. And so it's a, I've just really found it fascinating looking at his life and where I've seen some of his work. I apologize for sticking to a script here also. My computer crashed about two hours ago, and so I'm running on a computer that is not my own and hoping that everything runs smoothly. So uh, I was excited when Dr. Gerbens invited me to talk about macular degeneration, but I, I really had no idea how much I would cherish learning about Armin in preparation for this talk. He was not only an amazing artist, but he performed much of his work with what would be considered disabling eyesight for many people. So we're gonna talk about macular degeneration, we're gonna learn about the anatomy of the eye today, but before we do that, I would like Muriel to walk us through a little bit of Armin's background and his story. Armin Marazan was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan uh, in 1920 to first-generation Dutch emigrants. He was the youngest of four children. His parents joined up with other like-minded Dutch emigrants to form their own tight-knit, conservative Dutch colony where there was absolutely no tolerance for anyone pursuing an artistic career. He learned early on that even John Calvin, whose volumes Marazan read at age 16, was against the arts. However, Marazan was born with an exceptional gift, an indomitable drive to create art. From the day he was born until the day he died, he needed to create art and beauty. It was just inside of him and it had to come out. Marazan grew up during the Great Depression when the Christian Reformed Church was going through turbulent times ultimately splitting, forming the Protestant Reformed Church. His parents, unhappy with the church that they were attending and, and the split church, um, left and joined another church. But at home, 
Marazan overheard many heated theological debates with church leaders, and those debates had a huge influence on many of the decisions he made later in life, including temporarily changing that strong inner drive to become a fine artist to becoming a minister. He took his religion seriously. But one of the things that Marazan disliked the most as a young boy in church was singing the Dutch Psalms, all in those plodding half notes, on and on and on, sometimes 10 verses. His biggest concern was how many stanzas are we going to have to sing and how long am I going to have to stand here? Well, once in a while though, he would hear music composed by Mendelssohn, Haydn, and Sibelius, transporting him into another world. The words took on new meaning, and he felt, wow, this must be God. Years later, reflecting on those glorious feelings upon hearing classical music in church, Marazan said that was his epiphany. And for the rest of his life, he surrounded himself with classical music. You can see that musical influence today in many of his paintings. He never painted in silence. At age 30, Marazan married Betty Granger. And after they had five children, Betty went back to school to get a teaching degree. She wanted to help supplement the, her husband's meager income at that time. So now, without financial pressures, Marazan began creating masterpieces that were not based on marketability, but coming from his creative mind, spirit, and soul, experimenting with all kinds of different styles and techniques. His most prolific artistic years were in the late 70s, 80s, uh, late 60s, 70s, and 80s during which time he hosted several one-man shows in art galleries and museums. Unfortunately, in the late 70s, his eyesight began to fail to the point that by 1985, he could no longer read the paper or drive the car. But despite the diagnosis at that time of macular degeneration, that inner drive to create art and beauty kept Marazan going for the next 25 years, adapting his styles and techniques to accommodate his failing eyesight. In, 20, in 2010, at the age of 90, Marazan left his legacy to us, still painting right up to the month before he died. What an inspiration. Thank you, Muriel. Before we start an anatomy lesson of the eye, we're gonna take a little refresher course in Latin also. So this is a picture of the retina. The center part of the retina is called the macula, this big area right in the middle. It's about five and a half by five and a half millimeters in size. And that the macula, the term macula, comes from the Latin word which means spot. Specifically, it's actually the macula lutea. Lutea means yellow, so it means yellow spot. The reason I want to point this out in our discussions is it is not uncommon for me to hear a patient that comes to me telling me that they have immaculate degeneration, <laughs> which is close, it's close, it's the same root word. Immaculate, of course, means flawless or without spot, but we're gonna actually talk about age-related macular degeneration today. And to do that, I'm going to use a little app here, which is what crashed my computer. So this is a side view, and let's go back to the, the outside. So looking at the outside of the eye here, you've got, let's see if we can make this work. You've got the, there's a little gland that sits behind the eyelid that you see here called the lacrimal gland. There are a bunch of tear drainage, um, tear ducts actually that secrete fluid over the surface of your eye and go out the tear duct down into your nose here. So that's the outside of the eye. We can look at the inside of the eye 
from a side view here to give you a tour of the eye. So think of the eye like a camera. You have light that comes in through the front part of the eye, through the lens, and it focuses on the film in the back of the camera. If we look at that on the eye, you can see it here. The film in the back of the camera here is the retina. Starting from the front of the eye, moving back, you've got the clear window into the eye, that's the cornea. The white part on the outside of the eye is called the sclera. There's a colored part of your eye, that's the iris right here, in the middle of it is your pupil. There's a lens that sits behind all of that. That lens is what gets cloudy as we get older, that's what a cataract is. So when the cataract surgeon removes, uh, removes a cataract, they're removing this whole lens of the eye and they're replacing it with a clear lens. Behind all of that is a jelly substance. That gel substance fills up the back of the eye and that's called vitreous. Right behind the vitreous is this thin little layer that is responsible for our sight. That thin little layer is a third of a millimeter thick. It's made up of millions of little nerve fibers that all collect together to this little spot right here. That's the optic nerve, which is the nerve that connects the eye to the brain. So going back to our camera analogy, light comes through the eye, hits the film in the back of the camera, the retina. When light doesn't focus on the back of the retina, when it focuses, in this case, in front of the retina, you're nearsighted. So your doctor gives you glasses to refocus that light all the way to the back of the retina. That's how that, that extra glasses lens works. But you have to have an intact film in your camera for the eye to work properly. So if you have any abnormality, any problems with this center part of the retina, the macula, it's gonna affect your picture. Your picture is gonna be blurry. We can put the best lens in the world in front of your eye, but it's not gonna make the picture clear because there's a problem with the film in the camera. So we can look at the, the retina in a little bit of a different view as well. If you, let's see if this works for us. If you flip the picture of the retina up into a side view, again, we're looking at a tiny image, a third of a millimeter thick, and now we're seeing all the different cells in the retina. There's this little dip right in the middle of the macula called the fovea. The way God made us is he pushed, pushed a bunch of the nuclei of the cells, the dense part of the cells, out to the side so that when the light comes through, it's not diffracted or changed by anything, which is what gives humans our nice, crisp central vision. So you've got little cells in the outside part of the retina called photoreceptor cells. You've maybe heard of cones and rods. Cones are photoreceptors that are responsible for our nice color vision. Rods are the different types of cells that are more responsible for our nighttime vision or for motion and things like that. That's one of the reasons the rods, for instance, are responsible for us seeing shooting stars. You never see a shooting star when you're looking right at it. You always see a shooting star out in your peripheral vision because those are the cells that pick up that motion. There's a little tiny pigment layer at the back of the eye, and that pigment layer we're gonna talk a little bit more about today. The photoreceptor cells, the tiny little cells in the back of the retina that take the light impulse and create it into a neurologic impulse, they're connected to a pigment layer, and that connection is really important because the vitamin A cycle, which is responsible for our good vision, vitamin A has to be continually recycled in order to our, for our vision to work. If that pigment layer is missing, that cycle can't occur, and in that area of the retina, you won't have good vision. 
And then finally, down here, this is a blood vessel network called the choroid. That blood vessel network is separated from the retina, but it also supply, still supplies some oxygen to the retina. So it's important that there's not any abnormality in that layer. Now you are all experts on the anatomy of the eye. So what happens when the eye goes wrong? These little yellow spots that you see forming in the middle part of the retina are, are called drusen, D-R-U-S-E-N, drusen. Those are little deposits of material under the retina. They can happen as we age as a normal process, but when it happens more significantly, when it expands significantly, we call it age-related macular degeneration, the dry form of macular degeneration. If you look at this picture from a side view, you can see where those little bumps are forming. They're forming right here under that pigment layer that we were talking about. And for the patient, they see this blurring in the center part of the vision. So it doesn't black things out completely, but it can distort the center part of the vision. If you put all of those pieces together here, this illustration shows the drusen forming in the middle of the eye, it shows the bumps here, and it shows the blurriness. When you look at the TV, you can see the temperature, but you can't make out the, the middle portion in this area. I'll play that again so you can see it forming. So that's the dry form of macular degeneration. Now the wet form of macular degeneration, and this again may be where my app fails me, but taking a, the view into the eye, when we talk about wet macular degeneration, we're talking about the same process. Most of these people already have the drusen or bumps under the retina. It, the wet form occurs in 10% of patients with macular degeneration. And when we zoom down to the level of the retina in wet macular degeneration, you see this blood vessel form in between the choroid, it grows up under the retina, and it breaks, it leaks, it bleeds, it causes swelling. It's not just blood either, there is scar tissue formation that occurs into it, and that's why the wet form of macular degeneration is usually, and I say usually, the worst form of macular degeneration. It will cause not just this graying of vision, but this big dark spot, and if it goes untreated, it can actually expand even more and cause a larger blind spot. So the question, uh, let's see if this pulls back up. There we go. So how do you get macular degeneration? My quote to patients is that it's usually birthdays and bad luck. <laughs> Age, as we know, is the number one risk factor, and that's what you see on this graph. When you get out to 80 years of age in the white population, up to 14% of individuals will have some form of macular degeneration. If you go out to the age of 90, 30% of individuals will have some form of macular degeneration. We know that it's a multifactorial problem. We know that race is a problem. We know that genetics is a problem. 11 million individuals in the United States have some form of macular degeneration. And we know that the bulk of individuals have the dry form of macular degeneration. But there's about two million individuals that have the more advanced form of macular degeneration. And when I say the more advanced form, there are really two types. Wet macular degeneration is the one we all think about, the worst kind of macular degeneration. But there's this subset of patients with dry macular degeneration that is much more advanced and that's called geographic atrophy. And the reason I'm getting into the nitty gritty of this problem with geographic atrophy is that that is what Armin Marazan suffered from. 
And actually the rates, we used to think what just a small subset of patients had geographic atrophy, but we're finding that it is the end stage of macular degeneration. Whether you have wet or dry, geographic atrophy is the end result. So I showed you some nice animations. How do we view this in the clinic when I'm seeing patients? And this little machine here that we have called optical coherence tomography, basically a CT scan of the retina, is a non-invasive high resolution scan. This is actually a picture of my right eye. You see the black and white image of my eye here and the camera takes this picture, flips the retina up into a side view blows the picture of the retina up so you can see all the specific cell layers of the retina. In somebody with geographic atrophy, and let me go back to that picture, you can see this line here is the pigment layer in the back of the eye. And that has to be intact for you to have crisp vision. We see in an individual with geographic atrophy, that line doesn't look quite as healthy as the line did in my eye. Right here, it looks okay, still not great, but you get to this area here, this area here, and you see thinning of that pigment layer. This is a picture of the same individual, but just a color picture that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, and it shows this reverse C shape, which is a little bit uh, brighter, and it's brighter because that pigment layer is gone. When you look at the picture next to it, it is, it's a special technique called autofluorescence, which shows us areas of the retina which aren't working well, and the black area is not working well at all. The white rim around the edge of that reverse C-shape is areas of the pigment that will be disappearing soon. This is another patient, their left eye, Looking at the dates on this, you can see this as a picture that we took in August of 2010. It, it doesn't look terrible. There's this mottled appearance, this little stippled black appearance that you see on the black and white image up here. I saw this patient five years later and you start to see some changes. You see this white area here. That's an early area of atrophy that you see there and a little spot of atrophy there. This is one year later. You can see those tiny little spots in one year expanded. And then two years later, you see this large area of atrophy forming in the eye. And here you see that autofluorescence image over from 2016 to 2018. You see this big blank spot. So, Reminder too with macular degeneration, one of the reassuring things we tell patients is that you don't lose complete vision from this condition. All the other areas of the retina on the outside of it are still functioning okay. So this patient, although legally blind, is still functional to the point that they can move around their house and still do many things. But the vision on the eye chart doesn't necessarily correlate with their daily function. This is an example of a patient. You can see this large area of geographic atrophy. This little tiny spot in the middle, the this very center of the fovea, is still working for this patient. But when they functionally, when they look out, they see this big ring of black, and then the, just this little tiny spot in the middle. So on the eye chart, they can actually make out some of the letters. But functionally, it's not nice, crisp vision. And with that, I would like to invite Dr. Gerbens up to talk to us a little bit more about visual acuity and what that meant in the clinical course for Armand. Thanks, Scott. Good to have a good review. It's been a while for me. I first saw Armand Marazan in, on November 2 of 1978. I had been in practice for less than six months. Armand's vision, he was 58 years old. His vision was essentially 20-20 in both eyes, but there was early dry macular degeneration. Four years later, his vision was 20-50 in the right eye and 2200 in the left eye. 
Now, 2200 is the definition of legal blindness, but we do see with the vision of our best, of our best eye. I should stop and say just quickly, people ask, well, what in the world does 2200 or 2050 mean? Practically, a person with 2200 vision has to be at has to be at 20 feet to see what a person with normal vision can see from 200 feet. It's a, a good way of thinking it, about it. Um, I saw Armand again, uh, as I say, in April of 1982, and then he was lost to follow up for 11 years. I feel some guilt over that. Um, when he came back, um, he was 2200 in both eyes, he said, I can't see to read. I said, why didn't you come back earlier? Well, you told me, Dr. Gerbens, that nothing could be done. Why should I come back? And while that was true, um, Dr. Westhouse will talk about the importance of follow-up in just a little bit. It was at that time also that I referred Armand to Vision Enrichment, now called Association for the Blind and Visual um, Yep, thank you, thank you. And ABVI has a table right over there. We thought it very um, uh, appropriate to invite them to come. So if you have any questions about their services, um, be sure to visit the table um, over there. But as I say, um, between 82 and 93, vision decreased to 2200 in both eyes. And Armand, subsequent, we subsequently initiated yearly eye visit, uh, visits, and Armand experienced slowly progressive uh, visual loss. Early in the 2000s, he also was developing significant cataract, nuclear sclerotic cataract, which simply means yellowing of the lens. Uh, so he did cataract surgery in both eyes in October and November of 2001 with rather disappointing results. Basically, it was the macular degeneration that was the problem. Um, getting rid of the cataract improved um, um, some color vision. For those of you who have had cataract surgery, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and um, in 2002, then after his cataract surgery, left eye was always worse than his right eye. He's 2200 in the right eye. Count fingers, not, couldn't even see the big E, um, or anything larger, the 2400, which is larger than the 2200 on the Snellen chart there. Um, in 2005, 2400 in the right eye, count fingers at one foot in the left eye. Um, I last saw Armand in April of 2009, and he passed in April of 2010. Um, so that's just a short summary of. Um, Armand's course under, under my care. I, I must say that, that um, Grand Rapids Ophthalmology had an office out at South Health Pavilion, uh, the, the grounds of Pine Rest, and um, uh, Armand knew the day that I was out there and I'd receive a call and we'd have a talk. Larry, I lost a little bit more vision. I'd try to be as reassuring as I could. Um, and, and uh, we, we developed a wonderful relationship and that extended to um, when we, uh, a few of us acquired um, Burke's McGallery, turned it into Grand Gallery. I had the real pleasure of sitting in the chicken coop, the studio, and, um, and just listening to Armand talk of many, many subjects, um, art, philosophy, always with music um, on, and uh, it, it was a large part of my life. So I also, by the way, have his chart. <laughs> it's a treasure to me. Um, uh, when people come up to me, I can tell them Armand's visual acuity when he created the, the piece of art of his that they might have in their, in, in their house. During that 10 years when he was lost to follow up, I, I have a couple of, of his paintings here to show you. Um, they're pretty amazing paintings. Uh, and, and in my discussions with Muriel and in her book, you'll see that during those years, the 
1980s to 1990s, these were his most productive, they, it's referred to as his productive years. Um, so quite phenomenal. So a 2050 vision is you can be legal to drive if you have 2050 vision in one eye in the state of Michigan. So he was right on the border of legal driving vision uh, around 1980 or so, 1983. Um, and these are a few of the other paintings that he did. The detail on the rushing train, I believe, Muriel, this rushing train is the one that if you get a magnifying glass and look at it, there are a couple of the spots on the, on the conductors of the, um, not, it's not on this one, it was later. So some of his other paintings as his eyesight was failing, if you got a magnifying glass and looked at it closely, you could see where some of the little conductors on the, the electrical wires were missing the pole, but standing back and looking at it, you wouldn't notice. So besides telling patients to return for, let me go through, this is a positive outlook which we have here for you to see as well. Um, I'm gonna, Larry, I'm gonna have you talk a little bit more about the, the art for a moment um, and talk a little about, bit more about after 1994 and his vision began to fail even more there was a shift in his artwork. And again, I'm not the, the artist and not here to critique it, so Dr. Gerbens is gonna share a little bit more. As you know, Armand was a, a very realistic painter, um, and, and yet as his uh, vision decreased, um, he became more impressionistic. Now, was that all due to his macular degeneration? Probably not, because he was a wonderfully talented individual, and other artists who knew him have said that um, he might have just been changing the style. As you know, he dealt with triangles um, and squares and rectangles, and his painting was also always experimenting. So we can say his, his art became much more impressionistic, as opposed to realistic, was that macular degeneration? Probably partially, but also just the wonderful talent um, of, of uh, Mr. Marazon. As we said, um, as, as he got more macular degeneration, um, his color palette changed. Um, I'll walk to these pieces in just a minute. Um, and we'll talk about the examples on stage. How did it affect him, his psyche? In, in one of his interviews, Armand said, probably macular degeneration is the worst thing that can happen to an artist. He felt that strongly um, in, in Muriel's book, and he also said um, these to me um, in, his, in his moments where maybe he, a little darker moments where, where um, he felt the effect um, of his vision on his work strongly, he would say, if I can't paint, I'll die. In his lighter moments, he would say, I'm gonna paint until I get pigment on the tip of my nose. As you can see from the picture, to produce his work, he had to be very close, which is very typical of people with macular degeneration. So I'm gonna paint another, I'm gonna paint until my nose touches the canvas. I think the important thing to realize is that through all this, he persevered. We have um, a few pieces here. This is from 1990. As you can see, Armand also loved to deal with light, kind of Caravaggio-ish. You see the light in the foreground, you see the clouds, but light is coming through in certain areas. So his vision, I uh, don't know exactly because remember we lost him to follow up from uh, 82 to 93, but he was probably getting very close to legal blindness here. Um, 1994, um, 
he was essentially 2200 in both eyes. And then going across uh, to the other side here, uh, 2008, um, you can see colors getting bolder. Um, I do think at this time that one of Armand's daughters would line up his pigments for him. Again, um, he felt the need to continue to create. In a very important piece um, to Mary and I, this is 2009, A Boy and His Dog. From where you are, you see a lovely impressionistic piece of art. You get a little bit closer and you see some of the um, issues that Armand would face as an artist with macular degeneration. Um, and um, another thing that I should point out here is this purplish, is mauve the right word? Color, uh, you see that in many of Armand's work. He just seen, in fact, you can see it, I think, on the, on the picture up there. He just loved, um, loved that, uh, that color. Um, so, Macular degeneration definitely affected his work, um, but his talent was leading him in many different directions during this time, many different styles during this time also. But you're not going to see the, 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 the whether you like it or not, the realistic work that he did at a younger age during the 1970s and 1980s. So what do we do about macular degeneration? We've talked about the risk factors. We know age, birthdays is the number one risk factor. Race is really high behind that. Genetics, this uh, area of research is really interesting in genetics and macular degeneration. There are many different genes that have been linked to it, but not just one that we can say, aha, you're going to have macular degeneration because you have that gene. Um, one of the only things we can change in macular degeneration. One of the only modifiable risk factors is smoking that we know of. And Armand was known to have a cigar or a pipe in his mouth most of the time, but that is not something that he was going to be willing to give up, from what I understand. Macular degeneration is associated with other conditions as well, not necessarily causative factors, but associated factors would be hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and the big one that I ha see in my practice is depression. We know that 30% of our patients with macular degeneration suffer from depression. Many undiagnosed, many people who don't want to pursue avenues for treatment for depression. So sometimes discussion in the office, just that that's a possibility, is something that is, is very important to our patients. Dr. Gerbens just referenced some of the darker moments for Armin that he struggled with. Uh, and Muriel has shared with me also that he, uh, he was struggling in the late 1990s and she began working with him on a documentary and that seemed to lift his spirits and gave him a, a renewed purpose. And this, this picture was taken from that time. So what else can we do, do for this? Bas besides telling the patients to return for their routine eye exams, what else can we do? All of uh, you have probably seen the commercials for the eye vitamins. It almost makes you feel guilty if you're not taking them because uh, don't you value your eyesight? But these eye vitamins have been studied extensively by the National Eye Institute, specifically the age-related eye disease study, AREDS. If you walk into the pharmacy, you're going to see a whole rack full of these eye vitamins, and most of them will have AREDS written on them, the AREDS, and specifically now the AREDS 2 formula. The AREDS study looked at high-dose antioxidants to see if they had any effect on reducing cataract formation and macular degeneration. They found that it didn't really have much effect on cataracts, but for individuals with intermediate to advanced macular degeneration, they found that it reduced the risk of macular degeneration progression slightly. The average risk for an individual to develop advanced macular degeneration in their other eye 
is about a 30% chance over a five-year time period. And when individuals who already have some form of macular degeneration take the vitamin, they reduce their risk down to a 21% chance over five years. So I share this with you because the commercials make everybody think that they need to be taking this, but the clinical research studies don't necessarily say that. There is benefit to it, most definitely, and from a public health standpoint, it has a huge impact. But I like that to review that with patients as well, to let them know that, for instance, if they miss a day, it's not going to be that detrimental for their eyesight. We get a fair number of patients who are worried about going blind, and if they miss a day or run out of their medicine, what are the risks? The actual components of the vitamin, the AREDS2 formula, are listed here. So it's vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, copper, lutein, and zeaxanthin. The lutein and zeaxanthin are the new parts in that AREDS2 formula. They took the vitamin A out of the original AREDS formula, tested it with these two substances, and found it to be just as effective. The reason they did that is because we know vitamin A is not good for people who smoke. It actually increases their risk of lung cancer. So we're giving a vitamin to many people who smoke, that's why they have their condition. We could make a, another problem worse by giving them a vitamin. And so they found this formula, which is safe for all. The other thing that we do is go over the importance of checking your vision regularly. And that's using a special test called an Amsler grid. The Amsler grid is essentially a piece of graph paper with a little dot in the center of it. And you check one eye at a time and you look for wavy lines or missing lines on that grid. Somebody with macular degeneration could develop a change similar to what you see on the picture on your right. And if they're to develop something like that, we instruct them to call us right away and we'll take a look to see if they've changed from the dry form of macular degeneration to the wet form. Now the treatments for the wet form of macular degeneration, many of you have probably heard of now. We used to perform a thermal laser or laser photocoagulation, which worked very good at stopping the leaky blood vessel in wet macular degeneration, but it also causes a permanent blind spot. So when you're treating the center part of the retina with a thermal laser, the vision outcomes aren't that great. Later, they came out with a laser called photodynamic therapy, which is a pretty incredible treatment. We actually inject a special medicine through the veins that binds to this little spot in the eye, and then we shine a laser light of a specific wavelength to activate the medicine. So it's not creating a burn spot, it's just activating the medicine right where you need it to be activated. The problem with this is it still didn't, it slowed the progression of the disease, but didn't reverse anything. Since about 2005, we have had FDA-approved treatments that are called intravitreal injections. And whenever I say an injection in the eye, people usually cringe. I didn't show a picture of that because I didn't want anybody to faint in here, but this is the most common thing that we do in our office now. And we actually have the ability to improve vision with these injections in the short term. In the long term, we still feel like we're losing. In the long term, three, four, five years out now from injections, we know that we can still lose the battle to geographic atrophy, but in the short term, it is offering, offering significant gains. The unfortunate thing is it's not a cure. It's not reversing things completely. The future of macular degeneration is bright, and this is actually a slide taken from 2016 on clinicaltrials.gov, which records all of the clinical trials that are going on. And if you look at the yellow list in the middle, you'll see geographic atrophy is the next goal. There's one, one chemical that they're looking at for neo, neovascular AMD, which is another name for wet AMD. But the majority of our focus is on trying to find a solution for dry macular degeneration, the geographic form. Stem cell treatment, different viral treatments. There's some really 
radically new things that could offer hope in the future, but we don't have anything right now. The main treatment for macular degeneration for these patients is support. We've already mentioned that Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired is here. Uh, even though it's not a treatment, it still offers hope. There are different devices, uh, different magnifiers, different reading aids, different support groups that Association for the Blind will work with patients on. And uh, it's just a great resource for the individuals in our community. I love this picture of Armin using his magnifying glass, although Dr. Gerben shared with me that Armin didn't find the magnifier that useful. He was really just posing for a picture here. Finally, I'm reminded of the support that is more than just a low vision device or magnifying glass, and it's the people that surround us. I started out by sharing with you the story of my grandfather, and my, my grandpa wouldn't have been the person that he was without the faithful support and encouragement of his family, and specifically my grandma. Likewise, Armin had that support of his children and his wife, Betty, as well. And I love this picture taken by uh, his daughter, which captures Betty's support of Armin as I picture her smiling across a couch sharing life with him. I'll say it again, the stories of individuals overcoming obstacles fascinates me. Our community and the art world is, is better because of the contributions of Armin Marazan. And I want to conclude with this image and a quote from Glenn Peterson, who purchased this uh, 2006 Marazan painting. He said, it's probably not a great painting as paintings go, but I do believe it's an important painting. Marazan did not do anything accidentally. He knew what he was doing when at the end of his career he painted a little patch of beauty viewed from the darkness. I even wondered about the title. The full title is Looking West from the Old Line Shack. Why did he include the direction of Looking West? I don't think I'm reading too much into it when I wonder about Marazan at age 87 in the darkness, looking towards the sunset. It's like Beethoven writing his final works when he was totally deaf. My God, what a gift. So we'll take a few questions and I'll leave you with this. This is actually Armin's entry for our prize 2010 called In D Minor. In Paul Harvey's words, I encourage you to check out Muriel's book for the rest of the story. <laughs> Comments or questions for our presentations? <laughs> if you use the microphone, we can all hear you. I have a question about his biography. It was mentioned that at one point he decided he should go into the ministry, and then the next thing we heard was about his struggles as an artist. How, how did that transition take place? Do you know anything about, about that? He decided to go into the ministry mostly because he wanted to, wanted to feel accepted by his family and by the church, and with their uh, constantly saying art was not important, he thought, well, I'll go into the ministry then. Um, he went to Calvin College for a semester, but when he was there, a professor, a psychology professor, was starting to talk about man-to-man -man relationship. And prior to that, he had been instructed at home in catechism and church, I have a God-to-man relationship, God-to-man, and I'm in a lot of trouble. And now he went to Calvin, and, and it was like, you have a responsibility to man too, man to man. And he's like, whoa, I've got to get my mind cleared. And he was a brilliant, brilliant man. So you can see this was a conflict for him. So he quit Calvin and went out west. And, um, and then from there, he went to New York. And then he decided, I'm going to go back to creating art, which was so in him.
A question for Scott. Were you saying that the AREDS vitamins are ineffective as far as preventing macular degeneration? And secondly, totally different topic, could you say a little bit about epiretinal membrane? Sure. Um, in reference to the AREDS too, it, they are not going to halt the progression of macular degeneration. They're not going to reverse macular degeneration, but they will hopefully prevent the advanced forms of macular degeneration, that being geographic atrophy or the, the leaky blood vessel, the wet form of macular degeneration. The answer to the other question is why I like that little app that we have. And we'll, uh, I don't know if I have it all synced. So an epiretina, so if we want to talk a, about a couple different eye conditions, what often comes up will be glaucoma or other retina problems, other macula problems such as uh, epiretinal membrane or a macular pucker. An epiretinal membrane is a little piece of scar tissue which grows over the center part of the macula. It can be removed surgically. It can cause similar symptoms to macular degeneration because it's distorting the same part of the retina. That would be what an epiretinal membrane is, also known as a macular pucker. Oftentimes, people also ask me what glaucoma is, and while I have the anatomy lesson now, I like to show you the optic nerve, the nerve that connects the eye to the brain. That is what can be affected by glaucoma. Glaucoma causes damage to the nerve fibers of the optic nerve, and that's an irreversible cause of vision loss. So, so you're saying that we shouldn't take the ARIDS medicine until we've been diagnosed with macular degeneration? I do not typically recommend that family members or individuals, even with very early stages of macular drusen, take the AREDS vitamins. Okay. Why? Because we don't have any research that shows it's beneficial. Uh, they, they, the AREDS study had normal individuals and people with all stages of macular degeneration and they found that the people who did not have any signs of macular degeneration, even the people who had just very early stages of macular degeneration, over a five to 10 year time course, there was not any benefit for them. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm walking around. This is a very common question, and that's why I bring it up. The the, so the question, it, it's going back to the AREDS vitamins and, and wondering, well, what stage am I at? My doctor said I should be taking it, or my friend said I should be taking it. Do I need to take this vitamin? And I like to practice evidence-based medicine to know if there is a benefit the question was, is there harm? We don't know if there's harm. And that's why I offered the example of vitamin A in smokers. We think if it has vitamin written in front of it, it should be good for us, right? But we actually know that any substance that we ingest, if it's in too much quantity, could potentially be harmful. I don't, we don't have any evidence that the AREDS2 would hurt right now, but there are some studies out there, some really controversial studies, um, which are starting to come out, which show there may be some harm in some individuals with certain types of macular degeneration with certain genetic defects. So it's a really complicated, long-winded answer to your question. Ultimately, we don't know, but my recommendations are to people based on evidence that I have to know that it helps. We don't know if it hurts. 
Again, thank you very much. We've run out of time. <clears throat> Appreciate the presentation of all three of you together.